Okay, I'm down four. Good morning. And happy 4th of July. It's happy our 4th Independence July Day that we're celebrating. And we're glad to see you here at South Fork today. Um, I really feel like I need to bring some people up here with us who have really put on um, the 4th of July garb, you might say, <laughs> today. But we're glad to see you, and it's great to look out there. And for those of you who may be watching later, we're also glad that you're going to be joining us whenever you tune us in. We just know that during this time of year, um, there's a lot of people who are vacationing, people who are traveling, people who are having family reunions, people are together. Well, this is my family right here. You're my family and I'm glad to be here with you today. And today we're gonna have kind of like a flashback to the way it used to be when we just sang hymns. Today all of our songs are gonna be hymns. We know that they're gonna be ones that most of you will know and we hope you'll sing along. Because these hymns are ones who are going to give God, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, all of our, all of the glory and praise today. So if you uh, can, we invite you to stand with us as we sing today. Stand with us, and we're going to start with, to God be the glory.
walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. We give, we give you thanks, thanks and praise, praise your glorious name. name. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks and, and praise, praise your glorious name. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, now our God, God we, we give, give you thanks, thanks and, and praise your glorious name. You may be seated.
It is with this day in mind uh, that I jumped ahead in my Core 52 reading and just want to share just one sentence, two sentences uh, that Mark Moore wrote uh, about what we are celebrating here in his chapter on freedom. God paid the ultimate price for you. His love knows no bounds. We can therefore rest assured uh, that he'll never cease loving us. He'll never release us nor will he allow anything to separate us from him. I want to read Romans chapter 8, uh, the first few verses. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so we celebrate freedom in Christ together. Let's pray. Most gracious Father, what a price that you paid out of love for us by your, by your grace. Thank you for the freedom that we have that sometimes is so difficult to accept and to realize that we are truly free, that the, that the price for our sin is paid. And so that's what we celebrate together today and is, is our independence from sin and, and ultimate death. And so we thank you uh, for having the opportunity to come together and to eat bread representing Jesus' body and to, and to drink juice and be reminded of, of the new covenant uh, that we are under, covenant of freedom and opportunity. A covenant to be, to be a blessing, to bring hope. And so we just come together and say thank you for the freedom that we have in you. As we eat bread and drink juice together. Amen. God bless his Lord's Supper.
Wow, it seems like we're taking social distancing to the extreme this morning. I've, Shirley and I have been gone for, from you for a couple of weeks and drove in and walked across the parking lot and I said, wow, this is, this is downtown. I don't get many chances to dress as an African, and so I decided in light of today to, to be independent, step away from my culture, and wear, a, wear, a, wear again a Liberian chief's gown that is very meaningful to me, and so uh, thank you for that privilege. And besides that, last night when the discussion came about what I should wear today, my son-in-law said, wear this. And, you know, what, what could I say? I do bring you important and meaningful message uh, from Liberia uh, this morning. And I, I, I do want to really thank you for... Uh, for the hospitality and just <laughs> interaction and, and reception that you gave to uh, Ken and Carolyn Vogel uh, what, about three weeks ago. I just, uh, they, they were blessed and I, I thank you for that. Yeah, we, we ate together with them the night before and I don't know the last time that we had sat and talked with, with Ken and Carolyn, and during the course of the conversation, Ken and I were, were talking about the impact of our experience in Liberia on just how we, how we do things, how we speak, uh, and both of us found that, that we, had some, we, had, we had taken back to the United States some of the same characteristics that we developed in in Liberia, we, we still use occasionally some of the same language. Now, in, in his case, he's been, he was back in Liberia just a few months ago. Now, in my case, you know, it's, it's been many years ago, but yet, you know, I, I, still don't, I, I still don't say, well, something is very small. I say, well, it is small, small. Uh, you know, we just, you know, things become part of us. And uh, I can't tell you how many times Pat Funderburk has come up to me and, and thanked me for something that I've shared. But then she said, can't you just speed up? I said, no. <laughs> I said, I learned, I learned to speak with an interpreter. I speak in phrases and incorporate pauses because that's the way it works. Sometimes I start out with a thought and I get to the introduction of the thought and I forget what the rest of the thought was and I just go on. Segways, transitions. You don't need them when you... The, the interpreter is the segue and the transition. And we compared notes and found that we, we, had, we, we talked the same way. But I do want to take this chance to bring you a message uh, from the executive director of the Christian Education Foundation of Liberia. That's the, that's the organization that we worked with while we were in Liberia. And it still continues to, to, to function. It, it it, it trains church leaders, it uh, encourages them, it brings them together from a number of different what we would call denominations in Liberia. Uh, there's, uh, there's a very active and, and needed and helpful uh, health clinic that, uh, that they operate and what we were working with primarily uh, was uh, Liberia Christian High School it still functions. Now, it hasn't functioned all the time during the course of war and Ebola and COVID and, and all that's going on, but it, it's still operational. It's still, it's, still putting out, it's still putting out students. It's still blessing the people. 
and and then he, the the radio station that we we worked with it's not it's not in the same form that we designed it but it there's still a very active radio station a christian radio station in buchanan uh that uh, that we're we're pleased to hear about but amos jimmy Kladiba uh is now the executive director of the christian education foundation of liberia and he was back in the states uh uh, just recently last month, and uh, he shared that Liberia Christian High School was in a real crisis. The, the school year had ended early uh, because of, of COVID, and it's not really known when it is going to be uh, able to resume because the, you know, the, the resources just aren't there. The health facilities aren't there. Uh, the vaccine that has been so helpful in, in bringing it hopefully to a close here is not available in Liberia to the extent that it is here. We, we pray that it soon will be, but it's not yet. Um, and so we just, he, he said, you know, the school is dependent upon tuition that students pay. If students are not there, there's no tuition and therefore, we've got something of a crisis. And, and I think at the time he initially told me, uh, uh, they were uh, two months behind in teacher salary, approaching the going into the third month, and really no, no idea when that's going to resume. And so, uh, because of, of your consistent giving to South Fork's mission giving, uh, which, by the way, we don't send to Liberia every time. Um, uh, every time Bob uh, gives us a check from South Fork to Liberia Christian Mission, because it is dependent upon somebody going there to carry the money. Uh, there is no real good way of transmitting money uh, in and out of Liberia. So Amos Jimmy was in the states. And he said, I can, if you've got something, I can take it. And we were able to send $2,000 uh, to Liberia Christian High School for teacher salary. That's, that's two months' pay for the whole teaching staff. So that just gives you an idea of uh, really how, how basic the needs are. And, and, and I just really, really, really uh, thank you for sending that at a particularly critical time. Amos Jimmy tells you thank you. Ken Vogel told you thank you three weeks ago. Uh, Shirley and I tell you thank, thank you today. You're just, you're just a real blessing. Your, your faithful support of mission partnerships that, that comes from South Fork is really making a difference, not just in Li Liberia, but it's making a kingdom impact in in Taylorville and Thailand and China and Chicago and California and Abidjan and, and India. Vital ministry is taking, is enabled by your faithfulness. And so I say again, on behalf really of thousands, thank you. And that brings me to a question for today. Is that something that we will be able to continue? Not, not just the, the mission involvement, the vision partnerships, but just all that, all that we are called to do at South Fork. Are we going to be able to continue that? Do we dare believe that South Fork can thrive and grow going into the future? Do we dare believe that? Should we expect this congregation to continue to bring disciples into God's kingdom? I've read a number of church planting, church growth books. I've, I've talked to church planters. We've heard from Tony Collins. He's a church planter. We partnered with um, Joe and Amy, <laughs> and, and they, were, they, they have been church. Church planters 
if they were designing where to plant a congregation or start a congregation, would not choose here. The corner of Johnson and Breckenridge is, is not prime church growth real estate. Our demographics are not here. We, we used to have a lot of houses around here. I can talk to my mother and she would say, well, you know, there was a house here and a house here and a house here and a house here and a family here and here and here. They're not there. So, do we dare believe that there's a future for South Fork, for her ministries? Do we dare believe? As I was thinking about that, I, I realized just looking through, looking through Scripture, looking through the Bible, that God's Word has no shortage of situations described that are not prime kingdom growth scenarios. They just aren't. One of them came to mind very early in the early church. And turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 5. And I, as I'm reading the first portion of that chapter, ask yourselves, why would Ron say this is not a great church growth opportunity? Acts chapter 5, beginning from verse 1. But a man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And fear came upon all who heard of it. Now, there's a hint about why this is not really a, a, a great uh, church multiplication opportunity. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of, of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and all who heard these things. And I, typically when I've read the account of the early church and Ananias and Sapphira, 
I kind of tended to stop there. But at some point, I read on to verses 13 and 14. And something struck me. Look at the beginning of verse 13. Now the rest, <clears throat> excuse me, none of the rest dared join them. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you know, it, it really, I mean, yeah, this is, this is serious. <laughs> yeah, no wonder there was fear. No wonder none of the rest dared join them. But then I was struck by what Luke wrote in verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. Now, now just hold those verses side by side. Isn't that stark? Luke records in verse 13, man, there was such fear that nobody came around them. None dared join them. Join them. And then in verse 14, multitudes were added to the Lord. Multitudes joined them. God's word is filled with these kind of contrasts, these kind of anomalies. Believers, <clears throat> Old Covenant and New, Old Testament and New Testament believers found in apparent hopeless, futureless situations called by God to glorify Him and accomplish His mission. Take Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we're not going to look there and read, read the scripture, but remember Exodus chapter 3. God told a homeless, accused criminal, a refugee with a speech impediment to convince the most powerful nation on earth to give up its primary labor force. How is that possible? Moses was not in a position to lead anything out of anywhere. That's what he was called to do. And that's what he did. Or read Judges chapter 6. Your Bible headings probably have several Sections around chapter 6, 7, and 8, talking about Gideon. Gideon, by his own description, describes himself as, um, as the least of his clan. As the, as the little boy of his clan. Not capable of leading an army least significant man in the least of the clans. Told to take a, a skeleton crew of soldiers. Armed to the hilt. Well, not if you remember the story. <laughs> Armed with trumpets. And to win the freedom. Of his people. Or Jeremiah chapter 1. Prophet Jeremiah begins his account. By saying. God called me. An inexperienced. Uncertain. Youthful. Wet behind the ears. Jeremiah. To present God's message, 
not, not just to his own clan, his own family, his own community, his own neighborhood, but to the nations. With no experience, he was told to, to take God's message internationally. Every Christmas, we celebrate a common, ordinary teenage girl being selected by God to give birth to the Savior of the world. Just read about it in Luke chapter 2. <laughs> All four Gospels... All four. This is, the, this is the only event that is recorded in all four Gospels. All four Gospels tell the story, give the account of Jesus preaching to a multitude of people, 5,000 and probably more. And the apostles come to, come to Jesus and said, Jesus, you know, we got to wrap it up. Send them, send them home. They got to find something to eat. They're getting restless. And Jesus said, well, we'll feed them. One of, uh, one of my favorite authors, a man by the name of Philip Yancey, who wrote the book, uh, What's So Amazing About Grace, that I suspect that some of you may have read, suggests that in thinking about this, we, we, just, we just read John chapters 13 through 17. Final focus time that Jesus had with his disciples. Um, there, his, his, his designated ministry he knew was, was coming uh, to an end. Uh, the time for him to be arrested and taken to the cross uh, was, was uh, soon upon them. His intent from the beginning was to turn his ministry over to these these men who had been following him, who had been with him. Were they ready? Were they ready? They had pretty much proven themselves unreliable and unready. At every turn <laughs> that they had an opportunity, well, I can't say every turn, that's an exaggeration. At most turns when they had an opportunity, to do the right thing, they did the wrong thing. So what, 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 does, what does Jesus do? Uh, does, he, does he decide that they're just not up to the task? You know, maybe he chose wrong. Maybe these guys just couldn't cut the mustard. Or did he plead for maybe another three years or more time? Or maybe he, maybe he should plan to, to move his ministry to, to Rome uh, where there was power and, and influence and, and the message would just, would just radiate from there. Or maybe he should wait for better internet. I don't know. No. What did he do? <laughs> he took these, these guys who, who weren't ready, <laughs> and he turned the whole thing over to them, said, go for it. Well, you know what happened. I mean, they, they did. <laughs> and and this, this new faith spread like wildfire, spread throughout the world.
the early Christians didn't, weren't, weren't confused about their mission. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. They were, they were clear on that as are we. So under conditions that were more difficult than we can even imagine, what did the early Christians do? They went and they made disciples and they baptized and they taught. They didn't make excuses. Now they stumbled. A lot of Paul's letters address some of those issues, but they, there, were, there were challenges and there were issues. But God used those early Christians, refugees for the most part, to plant churches, to spread the gospel, to bring multitudes into the kingdom. He wrote to the church in Corinth, Paul did, in the, the second letter uh, to them. He said, don't worry about weakness. And this was a church that had some weaknesses, some challenges. Paul said, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Christ, I'm content with weaknesses. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. When I am weak, then I'm strong. So here's, here's my conclusion, just looking at this overview. The outcome of, of the work God's people undertake, the outcome of the work that God's people undertake at, at his behest, at his call, at his instruction. The outcome of the work God's people undertake at his behest is, is not determined by our inherent abilities. It's not determined by our limited resources or adverse circumstances. In fact, by God's grace and by the power of His Spirit, that outcome may well be inversely proportional to our perceived limitations. That's what Paul was getting at when he said, In my weakness, I am strong. In my weakness, God is glorified. In my weakness, His work is accomplished. So what does this, how does this apply to South Fork? How does it apply to us? I can say that when it comes to South Fork Church, we elders are together and thank you for adding two new elders to our to our number they that that's already in just the short time been an incredible experience getting the having having those elders Paul and John share with us in in what we're doing the elders are together confident that God will bring many new disciples into his kingdom through South Fork. We're confident of that. Paul wrote a sentence about his confidence for, for the churches that, that he, was, he was ministering to and writing to. Philippians 1.6 I am sure of this, Paul wrote, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 
We, we believe that for South Fork. If it were not so, you know, some years ago, some, most, most of us have been here for a bit. Some years ago, we would not have called Mike Nichols to come and steady the ship when things were a little rocky. It just wouldn't have been a good thing to do to, to, well, frankly, to waste his time coming here if we didn't believe in the future of South Fork. Or if we didn't believe that, it wouldn't have made sense uh, to, to call Josh Bennett to come and firm our foundation in the Word. It just wouldn't have made sense. Nor would it have made sense in this time to call Dave Johnson. To come to South Fork to help grow a healthy and thriving church body. To lead and to, to coach and to nudge and to teach and to encourage and to model servant leadership. It just wouldn't have made sense lest we believe. Do we as elders dare believe? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so because we believe and with disciple making in mind, we ask you to pray. Pray for each other. Pray for our community. Pray for our mission partners. Pray for God's Spirit to send us a godly worship minister. Pray for those who formerly cut donuts in our parking lot. Pray. Pray. It's because we believe, and with disciple-making in mind, that we're Updating signs and landscaping and technology and, and the parking lot. It's because we believe. And with disciple making in mind that we encourage you to, to join a small group. If you've not been part of one, then come and see this summer. At Dave and Sharon's for an experience an introductory experience, an exposure to small groups. Even if you've been in one, come anyway. Because you're going to be hearing more about small groups in homes. Because we think that will, that will help us to move the mission forward. To complete the task. You know, let's come back briefly to Acts chapter 5, verse 13. Because there was one phrase I, I didn't emphasize at the beginning. And yet I think that Luke's observation is so insightful. Acts 5, verse 13 None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. What made the difference? What was the transition between the fear on one hand and people overcoming and putting their fear behind them to 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 join with this body of believers. What was the transition? It was, it was seeing this body of believers. How they lived and how they, how they served. Uh, Philip Yancey. In the same interview that I referenced earlier. Reminded us that, that Jesus... When Jesus released his disciples, when he released his disciples to take over his ministry, the first thing he did 
was wash their feet. He washed their feet. He brought love to the front. And he prayed for unity among his people. We serve people. We love people. We form the kind of community that makes people say, Aha! Uh -huh. So that's what God had in mind. I'm going to read two verses from Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. It's a prayer, so, so think of it prayerfully. And then I will close with a prayer. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or all we think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And let's pray. Our most gracious Father, we, we do trust. Sometimes we question, but we trust uh, we trust you to, to overcome, overcome our, our misgivings, our doubts and our questions. We, we trust that you will guide us as we minister to this community. As we, as we send faithful out to other places. As we partner with, with your servants all over the globe. Father, we, we trust that somehow in ways that we barely understand that you, you are telling us to keep on keeping on. Keep on being faithful. Keep on trusting in what God can do through this congregation. For like Paul, South Fork says, in our, in our weakness, we are strong. We are strong in you, Lord. Amen.
Dave and I assume Job will be back next week. So look forward to, to that. Uh, and look forward to information, announcements coming forward uh, about uh, small group experience at Dave and Sharon's. Um, my, our guests, <laughs> we are still developing kind of the plan, but uh, I think what you should be able to anticipate, and Dave will, will spell it out in the newsletters coming forward, but just that we'll, we'll come together, we'll just interact, we'll connect, and maybe, maybe break apart into some smaller groups uh, during the course of the evening. We're going to have four of those uh, during the course of the summer, two in July and two in, uh, in August. Uh, so just look forward to those and invite, 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 I don't know, uh, uh, bring, bring a friend. You know, just uh, we, we, want, uh, we want you to experience um, small groups. We think it uh, will be a, just a, a real opportunity to, to connect with each other, to be a blessing to each other and to the community. So, thank you. If you'll stand, we're going to sing God Bless America. Our final plea is for God to bless America. fireworks and have a wonderful week. See you back next week.